The Bitcoin roller coaster is back on the upswing. The cryptocurrency hit a new record high to close in on 8,000 just days, as you can see with this chart, just days after it plunged from 29% on Monday. That die followed the delay of a technology upgrade known as a SegWit two times. I hope I'm saying that right. That wiped out some $38 billion in market value. Analysts think investors are piling back in to ensure they collect coins on both sides of the so-called fork that the upgrade will create. Well, our next guest uh, runs Tokyo-based Bitcoin exchange Coin, which claims to be among the biggest in the world, exceeding $12 billion in transactions over the last couple of years. Joining us from Singapore is a co-founder and chief executive, Mike Keomori. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mike. 29% down Thank on Monday. Thank you for inviting me. Full, uh, yeah, fully back today and then edging towards 8,000. It's down, it's uh, 7,831 as I speak. What gives? Yes, well, as you mentioned before, um, Bitcoin had a, a software upgrade. And because it's consensus driven, not everybody agrees. And when that happens, there's these risks of the blockchain splitting up. And this is what we call the hard fork. Um, this time it didn't happen. So the price came back up. But then there was another group who supported a Bitcoin derivative. So all these things in short term will happen. But when you look at long term, since Bitcoin um, inception in 2009, if you are a long term holder, you will make money. It depends when uh, you go long term with it, surely, Mike. Uh, let's just t tell me. No, what actually, when you look at the past eight exactly. years. Exactly. Yes. Can you, can you just, exactly, if you had done it then, but tell me what a hard fork is and how that all works, please, and the difference between a Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Yes, so I look at Bitcoin um, similar to a software. So when you had Windows, um, you had Windows 95, <coughs> Windows 2000, Windows XP. So there's all these upgrades that happen, even in um, Apple iOS. It's similar in Bitcoin blockchain as well. When it first came out in 2009, it was limited in capacity, in performance. So all of these things, similar to technology, it innovates and it improves. Um, but because it's not one issuer, it's consensus. Some people agree with the upgrade and some people don't. And when those things happen, it splits. So that's why there's already four Bitcoin derivatives, such as Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, and there could be a Bitcoin Cash Plus. So, Mike, do you have any concerns about the growing number of Bitcoin offshoots? Well, so... Uh, that, that's very interesting. So I look at it similar to software where there could be multiple version. One could be pure, mostly on Bitcoin as a currency. One Bitcoin, like Bitcoin Cash, which has higher capacity and larger block size, it could be used more for commercial use. So there would be several. That said, having too many will confuse the general public. So it's not a good thing if there's too many. Is it possible that down the road, uh, uh, Bitcoin continues to fracture more and more? Or is there a chance that down the road as well, we might see a reconsolidation of it? it? It could. It could. Or there could be another cryptocurrency, another token um, that could come and be more commercially um, available and something that everybody embraces. So there are other cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum, which is smart contract driven and it could be embraced by everybody else. So there's already 1,200 cryptocurrencies and we're still in the early beginnings of it. Well, there's been a gradual acceptance uh, of this cryptocurrency, perhaps not many of the others. Are you talking to many of the international banks about derivatives products or indeed just building Bitcoin products? So, so our business is an exchange. We're independent. So any of these tokens that needs to be sold, bought, exchanged uh, can use our exchange. At the same time, there's the CME 
who will be launching a Bitcoin futures product. Um, there's other uh, financial institutions that are starting to offer exchange services. So the mass adoption will happen over the next coming years. What about nations? They've had a lukewarm relationship with Bitcoin. Japan's been more accepting than others. Tell us about that and tell us about this mixed message coming out of China with Bitcoin and indeed other cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, Japan is in the forefront because Mt. Gox, which was the largest um, hack of a Bitcoin exchange, which happened in 2014, was in Japan. It happened in their backyard. So that's why the Japan FSA needed to make sure that that will not happen again. So it was partially defensive, but also it was to foster innovation. So Japan was, is the first country nationwide to regulate cryptocurrency exchanges. And now many countries are following Japan. Although some countries like China is banning crypto altogether. So it is something new and countries are varying on, a, on how they approach it. Mike, there was a piece the other day uh, about some gentleman saying that it was not out of the realms of possibility that a Bitcoin could be worth a million dollars. Was he trying to get a headline? No, actually, um, it, it's very interesting. Um, people tell me it's a bubble. People told me a year ago it was a bubble. Um, two years ago it was a bubble. But some people say it could be one Bitcoin could be worth half a million or a million. Bitcoin, there's finite amount of Bitcoin that's available, which is 21 million. There are 16.5 million already mined and in circulation. So there's only 4.5 million to go. It's a very different from a fiat currency where a central government can continue to print um, their national currency. Um, compared to that, Bitcoin, there's a finite amount. And when there's more utility and there's more demand, obviously the price goes up.